This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or the Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. Hey everyone, just a quick announcement before we get started. In case you haven't heard, Reasonably Sound now has a Patreon, a way for you to support the show and make sure it not only keeps happening, but keeps getting better. If you're interested in supporting Reasonably Sound, and I would appreciate it endlessly if you were, you can head over to patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound, all one word, all spelled out to see what's on offer. And of course, to everyone who is already supporting the show, thank you so, so, so much. I can't even begin to describe how humbled I am that you would spend any of your hard-earned cash bucks on this here little show about noises. And actually, speaking of which, enough gushing onto your regularly scheduled podcast. So I'm an only child, but when I would go on vacation or long road trips with my parents as a kid, I would always bring a companion of some kind. Not a living companion. As a teenager, it was my yellow, hyper-shock-resistant disc man covered in all kinds of stickers because, you know, that's what you do when you're a teenager, I guess. Cover stuff in stickers. Today, my companion is usually a book, though I guess relatedly and also sometimes isomorphically. I always have my phone too. But before those things, before books and the Discman, I had my Game Boy. My parents bought me a Nintendo Entertainment System, an NES, for Christmas when I was seven. And surprise, surprise, I showed great interest. I thank my lucky stars that, unlike some parents, they chose to not keep the video camera running during Christmas present opening that year. My reaction would surely have been deemed pure gold and shuffled from format to format as I grew up, only to find its way eventually onto YouTube. Suffice it to say that there was no shortage of effusive exclaiming at the ability to play Mario and, more importantly, Paperboy, in my very own home. The Game Boy followed not long after. I'm sure, as a strategy on my parents' part to keep me busy and quiet during periods of long travel. As a child, I developed a family nickname, um, Michael Y, for my constant barrage of often trivial or unanswerable questions, and so I suspect, but I, I haven't confirmed, that everyone recognized portable video games as providing a way to let me ask and answer a wholly different set of questions on my own. By adulthood, I'd owned several Game Boys, but the one that sticks in my mind the most is, of course, my first. Massive gray, brick-like. By the time I replaced it with a Game Boy Color modified to have a backlight, begrudgingly, but still, it had a backlight, my original Game Boy had been outfitted with all of the accessories. Magnifying flip-down front-lighted visor, extra speakers, extra-large rechargeable battery pack, and of course its own black canvas carrying case, complete with cartridge storage. It was a monster. Which is to say, there was a kind of Game Boy industrial complex. It was an economy unto itself. I remember standing in the aisles at Toys R Us and looking at the endless wall of little cards representing available games. Behind me, all of the available accessories. The Game Boy was, and I think remained up until the smartphone, something of the paradigmatic portable gaming console. And the numbers, they support this thought. 
The run of the product line, which includes any object titled Game Boy in some way, lasted nearly 20 years. From 1989 to 2008, the Game Boy line sold over 200 million units. For comparison, Sega's Game Gear sold 11 million total units during its seven-year production run, the Atari Lynx just 3 million in six years. So I hope that you'll permit me the claim that the Game Boy is the single most popular handheld video game console. But importantly, as Kevin Driscoll and Joshua Diaz point out in their 2009 paper Endless Loop, this additionally made it the single most popular synthesizer, as in the musical instrument, even if people didn't use it as one. This is what we're going to talk about on this episode of Reasonably Sound, how the Game Boy, alongside a good number of other older video game systems and their presence in the lives of so many kids, their technological and cultural significance, ended up turning them into musical instruments, which in turn factored into the birth and growth of a whole genre of music called chiptunes. For those of you unfamiliar with the chiptune genre, the snippet you just heard, Can't Stop Us by Chipzel, which I know from the amazing mixtape project Chiptunes Equals Win, is pretty representative. Upbeat, lots of arpeggios, a thing we're going to talk more about later. Uh, a tendency to sit in the higher parts of the frequency spectrum, not a lot of big, beefy bass notes in this kind of music, and with that signature kind of timbre, squelchy, raspy, buzzy, in a word, video gamey, because it's made with video game equipment, or gear which emulates video game equipment. If you need a refresher of what early video game music sounds like straight from the chips, pins, I guess, here are some favorites. First, of course, Tetris for the Game Boy. And then Times of Lore for the Commodore 64. And finally, Ultima for the Atari. Now, I know I made a big deal up at the front about the Game Boy specifically, and we're going to make a big deal about it again in a little bit, but yeah, all kinds of old school video game gear is responsible for these lo-fi blips and bloops. They're called chip tunes, after all, not boy tunes. It's not the specific system that matters so much as it's, drum roll please, sound chip. This is one reason chiptunes is an interesting genre. We don't call rock and roll drums and electric guitar tunes. Hip hop isn't MPC music. Classical isn't dead white guy scribble. But chiptunes is music made by or made to sound like the old sound generating chips in early home video game systems. This effectively means that chiptune as a genre spans a particularly large array of sounds from bands like Anamanaguchi to Fat Frumos to 10,000 free men and their families. But we are severe to you! 
If in all of these examples the chip sounds were removed or replaced with more well-known instrument sounds, we'd call these three very distinct genres. And in a way they are, but to many listeners, the chip sounds themselves are so recognizable and have such a strong association that it's difficult to hear music using them and not think of it as making a point. Unlike a guitar or a piano, or even your normal run-of-the-mill synthesizer, chip sounds still mean some very specific thing. And so whatever other sonic rifts exist within the genre, they're closed to a certain degree via the presence of chip sounds. This makes the genre complex, though the chips driving it may be, relatively speaking, rather simple. But okay, here we may now ask, what chips? Surely there are many chips. Why? these chips. The long and short of it is that Dem chip blips specifically sit at the intersection of an exceptionally complicated brand of nostalgia and a rather simple brand of creative limitation. We're going to talk about the limitation first. Oh, and also, as a quick, rather technical digression, you may hear chiptunes referred to as 8-bit music sometimes. If you're an audio nerd, you probably take this as a reference to the bit depth of the audio produced by some old video game equipment. Bit depth is a major factor in determining overall sound quality. Uh, for instance, digital audio files tend to be 24 bits, CDs are 16 bits, some early video game consoles produce 8-bit sound, but some others produce 16-bit sound. The Game Boy is 4-bit audio, so clearly we're not talking about audio quality here. What's really going on is that 8-bit refers to processing power, specifically the number of simultaneous bits a video game console's processor can calculate. Most modern computers, including games consoles, have 32 or 64-bit processors. The Commodore 64, NES, and Game Boy all have 8-bit processors. However, the Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, and Mattel Intellivision, all with 16-bit processors, are occasionally implicated in discussions about 8-bit music. So for the sake of accuracy and simplicity, we're going to avoid all bit-related labels and stick just with chip tunes or chip music. So when we say chip, we're referring to specific, distinct, integrated circuits manufactured to produce sound for these old video game consoles. There have been a couple well-known chips, but arguably the most well-known by name is the MOS Technology 6581-8580SID, aka the SID chip for sound interface design. The SID could be found in the Commodore line of video game consoles, including the well-known and much-beloved Commodore 64, which I strongly associate with games like Bubble Bobble, Ghosts and Goblins, And load runner. The SID was developed by Robert Yannis. Yan Yannis? Yannis. Y A N N E S, your guess is as good as mine, who was frustrated that console gaming systems hadn't, up until that point, supported much musicality. He said that existing music technologies in video games were, quote, primitive and obviously had been designed by people who knew nothing about music. The beeping of Pong, for instance, when the ball hits the paddle or when a player scores a point, they were all originally supposed to be sound effects, clapping, booing, and so on. But that idea was scrapped pretty quickly in the face of memory constraints. In her book Game Sound, Karen Collins includes a story told by Pong designer Al Alcorn, where he explains that the sounds of Pong are simply what he could make the machine do without adding extra stuff. They were, quote, the sounds that were already in the machine. Well, for Giannis, the developer of the SID, already in the machine sounds weren't good enough. 
But you know, this is 1981. Computers aren't the number crunching, memory having powerhouses we're used to now. Storage and processing capability were minimal. The SID and all of the other chips that would come along and resemble it couldn't store, you know, sounds. It wasn't going to play back samples of dogs barking or Chopin's minute waltz or whatever. The sounds that the chip would play back were sounds that the chip itself could make. It would synthesize them. And these chips could make a few very specific sounds, and not many of them at the same time. Most old console game sound chips had two to four voices, meaning that they could make two to four sounds at the same time. The SID had three voices, the Game Boy chip has four. Each of those voices can be switched between one of a few waveforms, usually a pulse, triangle, saw, and noise wave. One of Game Boy's four voices is a wavetable voice, which basically just means a slightly more complicated sound within very, very strict limitations can be synthesized. The pitch of each voice can be changed, of course, and the voices can be combined and cross-modulated in various ways. Most chips have a filter of some kind, and of course, volumes can be adjusted. But none of this happens the way you may assume it does. SIDs aren't, or at least weren't, and generally are not now, hooked up to keyboards or knobs. The kinds of chips we're talking about here belong to a larger category of chip called programmable sound generators, or PSGs. Meaning, video game music programmers are just that. Programmers. Chip music played by chips in video games is written in code, originally assembly code, which looks, roughly speaking, like gobbledygook. Strings of random seeming letters, numbers, and occasional symbols chunked together into small segments representing the lowest positions in the data amount totem pole. Today, chip musicians don't have to write assembly if they don't want to, but a fair amount of songwriting is still done in programs known as trackers, which might as well be programming. LSDJ or Nano Loop, both of which exist as actual Game Boy cartridges, are two of the most popular chiptune trackers, and basically, they're just empty grids. Each spot on the grid controls a different value for each note, pitch, filter settings, volume, that you enter manually, one at a time, for every note. You fill out a bunch of grids, Fill them out differently, different strings of carefully entered values, you switch between them in time, and you've made a chip tune. It's not programming, but it's also not not programming. In other words, chip music is not just limited sonically, but difficult practically. Which, if you ask a chip musician, or really, heck, most musicians, most artists for that matter, is kind of part of the fun. What's that, what's that famous saying? It's like, limitation breeds awesome ideas because I mean, what other choice do you have? Am I right? Something like that. Basically, if you're into creative limitation and you want to make electronic music, this is one of the most limiting methods, short of, I guess, engineering your own chip. Blindfolded. While drunk. So anyways, this means that video game music programmers then, and chip musicians now, have to come up with all kinds of tricks, techniques, and workarounds to get the kind of complex sounds that they want from very, very simple bits of chip kit. One such trick, and one of the hallmarks of chip music, is the arpeggio. Now, in strictly musical terms, an arpeggio is when you have a chord and you play each note in that chord one at a time. Simple, but what chip musicians old and new figured out is that if you speed up that arpeggio, interesting things start to happen. What was once three or four distinct notes, one after the other, becomes a complex of sound effects, seemingly multiple voices all at once, though it is but one. Arpeggios then create complexity out of simplicity, which is hella exciting. And they do so using only one voice, which means the other between one and three remaining voices can be doing other stuff, blipping about other things, making bonk bonk noises. To give you a sense of what the arpeggio can accomplish, I'll play some examples. Each of the following come as presets in the Plogue Chip Sounds software synthesizer. They're all arpeggios created using only a single voice on a single emulated chip. No outside effects or anything. Now, 
Every signature sound has its weird secret details. The Columbia Records sound of the 60s meant re-recording records in this one particularly reverberant stairwell. The Sigur Rós sound is all thanks to a swimming pool. And the old Wu-Tang sound is largely credited to the second-rate sampler they were using in their early career. For chip tunes, it's the wave shapes and the low bitrate of the chips, sure, but also, I think, on the genre level, on the music writing level, and more than a little, it's the arpeggios. In my mind, the way arpeggios are deployed in chip music is a kind of metonym, a small, simple part which very effectively references the whole. A sonic characteristic which channels much broader concepts of what it means to make and enjoy chip music. Which does start us down this road of talking about the kinds of associations people have with chip tunes and the meaning we can find in the usage of video game gear as a musical instrument. If we follow the genealogy of chiptunes and the genealogy of what we'd popularly term hacking at present, we'd end up in some of the same places. One of those places is a scene, specifically the demo scene, which is kind of what the name implies. A scene where the demonstration of skills was on display, specifically skills related to programming, visual effects, and electronic music. Active in the 80s and 90s, the demo scene was home to lots of early digital animation and most notably early software cracking, including that of old school games, meaning removing them illegally from their intended platform and making them available to play for free on the same or other platforms. Now, as was the custom at the time, the team which cracked a piece of software would insert a kind of intro into its code. Advertising their leet skills, that intro screen would show some piece of animation, often utilizing spinning and swirling letters and numbers to great effect assembling to show the team name. Things like perfect, reality, essence, nebula. Intense. You get the picture. It was the 90s. These intro screens were also usually accompanied by music. And as Driscoll and Diaz again point out, this is arguably the first time where people who were not at all involved in the development of video games were able to use those games to make music for an audience. Trackers do have a long history predating LSDJ and Nanoloop cartridges, but mostly as at-home retail available tools for learning how to compose music, not as avenues for creative expression meant to be heard by many. This, the demo scene, then, is the birthplace of chiptune, I think, more so than the American and Japanese game developers who wrote all of that early, influential video game music, which I see as distinct from chiptunes. Because, I don't know, I think chiptune isn't just the use of video game equipment to make music, it's also kind of a, a resourcefulness. Or, in some very broad sense, it's the hacking of that equipment to get what one wants out of it. It's a creative misuse, a kind of subtle subversion. Chiptunes invert the sound-video relationship of games by putting the sound first. Chiptunes take mostly visual home entertainment technology and put it in public, on stage, and emphasize the sonic. For me, the chiptune arpeggios evoke all of this. They're kind of a hack, a creative workaround in the face of technological limitation. They evoke the playful nature of these older games, but do so absent any visual information or player action. They're almost, to use Michel Chian's terminology, acousmatic, a sound separated from its visual source, adopting new meaning in its audio-only context but still connected somehow, in some ghostly manner, to its origins. In this case, those of play. Malcolm 
Malcolm McLaren is most famously the guy that sold punk rock to the world. He worked with the New York Dolls, managed the Sex Pistols, and has generally had a hand in pretty much all of the pies comprising the popular music vernacular. He was, as my parents might say, like horseshit everywhere. A saying which makes a lot more sense if you live in Boston, I guess. Anyway, in 2003, McLaren wrote a piece for Wired about how chiptune music was the new punk rock. Anti-establishment, often difficult listening, community-driven, resistant to commercialization, made with cheap old gear, and so on and so forth. The chip community, however, balked. For one, old video game gear isn't mostly just laying around. I know, I know, it seems like it should be, but really... It isn't. I don't know where any of my old video game systems are. And I just called my father to find out if he knows. And even he, he has no idea. He has no clue. Between the heyday of the demo scene and now, there was a 15-year kind of chip dark ages during which, I don't know, all of our parents recycled our NESs, let them turn to actual dust, put them on eBay? I have no idea. And if they are still sitting around... It's definitely not guaranteed that they'll function the way an old guitar might after 10 years in the attic. To get our hands on an old working Game Boy or old NES, it's not exactly dirt cheap either. Struck with intense nostalgia writing this episode, I purchased a refurbished original Game Boy on Etsy and it cost me a hundred bucks. It will take eight weeks to ship. And while it might be easy to look in from the outside and see all of the things that I just described, the genealogy leaning back to the demo scene, the relationship to hacking, and to listen to the music and think, this is in direct opposition to what's happening on the pop charts. This is a music of rebellion. From the inside, it seems like it's a little different. It's hard to deny that there is a counterculture aspect to chip music, but over and above any perceivable rebellion I think that as a genre and a community, the defining relationship here is one with, surprise, surprise, play. I honestly don't know if most chip musicians consider themselves rebels in some way, counterculture in the same way that punks did. I certainly don't get that sense. I don't get the sense that they choose to make chip tunes because the sound is hard or anti-commercial. I get the sense that they do it because of its nostalgic associations, because it sounds interesting and it forces one to problem solve, and it's it's fun. Chip music is playful. Even the dark, moody chip music, even the aggressive, vaguely punk rock chip music, like 10,000 Free Men and Their Families, can't escape its association with games, with play, with playfulness. In one way, we've moved far, far beyond Al Alcorn's music that was just inside the machine. But in another way, this music is presented to us with a kind of roadblock. It may never, and maybe should never, get outside of the machine, outside of its relationship to the machine lose its relationship to the hardware that inspires it or makes it possible. In Playing With Sound, Karen Collins writes of interactivity and video games that, quote, without a player, without the act of play, it's just code, lying in wait. I feel that this is true of chip music as well. It's just code, lying in wait. It must be played. But importantly, I think this play is different from guitar play, piano play. This is why the chiptunes genre is and needs to be so wide. It necessarily approaches a different kind of play. To play guitar is to make actual, some potential energy held by the instrument. One plays in that one uses the guitar to perform a task it is built specifically to do. One plays a Game Boy on stage as a chip musician in a much different way. Because one is, in that situation, unavoidably referencing the intended purpose of the technology. Literal play. For non-serious recreational activity. 
for pastime. To play guitar is really to work, to labor. To play a Game Boy is literally to play. So to play a Game Boy to play music is to turn play into work. And without this complicated, multifaceted act of play, the Game Boy is not, like the guitar, an instrument. It's a toy. It's a computer. Without its player, it's just code, lying in wait. And so, in more ways than one, chip music must be played. It's a, a game and a puzzle, a set of problems and a performance. Unable, for better or worse, but I think better, to escape association with all of those Long road trips with mom and dad. My name is Mike Rugnetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at Reasonably SND. You can find Reasonably Sound on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Reasonably Sound. You can find me, Mike Rugnetta, on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and Snapchat at Mike Rugnetta. <laughs>